Hello and welcome to tonight's webinar, everyone. Um, we'll just wait a second while the guests, my guests, come up on the stage. Cool. Hi, Bayard. How are you? Good, Stacey. How are you? Good. We'll just get Ben up on the screen. He shouldn't be too far away. Um, as people are coming on the webinar, feel free to say hi and where you're from so we know who we're talking to and also if you can hear us just in case there's any technical issues on anyone else's end. Um, cool. Hi Richie. Um, I'll start introducing while we wait for Ben anyway, right. um, just to get on with things. Um, my name's Stacey. I'm the social media and content manager here at Relab. And joining me on stage, um, you'll be familiar with Ben and Bayard. Um, ben will be jumping on in a second. Um, I'll leave Ben to do a formal introduction. Um, but the Relab team are really excited for tonight's webinar. I think this is quite a, an anticipated topic now that um, with the previous one, we really set the scene for tonight's one. and. Um, we're coming up pretty close to August, so I guess there is a lot of interest, a lot of questions going on. Um, so I'm sure this will be a really informative session for everyone. Um, I'll just check if Ben needs inviting on stage. That. Okay, um, and I'll just cover some quick admin things um, for the webinar. Um, if you've got any questions, pop them through in the chat and we'll um, address those at the end. Um, I'll be managing the chat as well, um, just in case anyone's got any technical issues or general webinar questions, I can answer those ones. Um, and you'll also receive a recording of the webinar in your inbox uh, later on, um, and it will be available on Subdivision NZ's Facebook and Relab's Facebook um, tomorrow, that will be. Um, and yeah, with that said, I'll pass on to Ben. Awesome. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks for that. Um, hope everyone is um, having a great evening. Today, we're starting the part two series, which will be talking about um, the new year two plan and the changes there. Um, and what we'll do is we'll go through a summary of changes. We'll go and let everyone know how to use the GIS viewer for the preliminary response viewer. A lot of people have been asking about that, and I think it's a good idea to showcase that. Um, we'll do some illustrative examples of the changes so people can understand from a illustrated pr perspective. People will like to picture things and also what are qualifying matters because that is something that's quite important. And I think Bayard will be able to explain that very well. Um, so what we'll do is we've got a lot of material and um, thanks for Bayard to come on again because last time we had a great chat on the history. Now, um, let us know what's uh, what's new, what's the um, changes there. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, and thank you, everyone, for kind of joining this one. I, I think it's gonna, it's a highly probably anticipated one, I suspect. Um, and no doubt you've seen a lot of um, information coming out through the media. Um, and, you know, as it, it'll get heavier and heavier as we move towards August. Um, yeah, so just backtracking a little bit. So the past um, uh, webinar was really just understanding the history of the unitary plan and where it came about and and, and the conclusion really um, that, that's come about um, since 2015 is that um, the unitary plan didn't quite achieve um, the level of zoning it needed to achieve to accommodate housing. Um, and that is essentially um, the basis, I guess, of um, the NPS or National Policy Statement, which has come about um, and the Housing Enabling Act, uh, which has also come about. Um, the Productivity Commission was kind of set up in 2015 and identified still that Auckland needed over 100,000 houses to be provided. Um, and that resulted, you know, in the movement towards um, developing the National Policy Statement for Housing, uh, which both kind of the Labor government and, and national government kind of signed off on. Um, it's probably important, Ben, to, to, to make it clear to the audience that there's two very different components um, to this process. Um, and, and it seems to, I think, the, yeah. I think the general consensus is it gets bundled up into kind of one, one discussion where, where it's probably not quite accurate. Um, there, there's the national policy statement, which is um, essentially a policy statement um, driven to provide 
um, high density housing within walkable um, areas and close to public transport. Um, and that national policy statement always also wanted to remove um, car parking limits. Um, so that was a very high level directive from the government um, to say to councils, you need to change your um, district plans to allow for um, high density housing, you know, within, for example, 1.2 kilometres of the city um, or 800 metres from metropolitan areas um, or 400 metres from um, town centres slash villages. And they wanted that kind of height within those areas to be, you know, between the region of kind of four to six storeys in height. Um, and they didn't really want any parking to be to be uh, restricting people's ability to develop in those areas. So that's the national policy statement. And that, that was uh, directed in 2020. Um, off the back of that actually came the Enabling Act, which I, I suspect the audience is going to be more interested in. Um, and the Housing Enabling Act yeah. is the one that um, is essentially an amendment to the Re Resource Management Act that allows you to build three houses um, on your land as of right um, under a new form yep. of zoning, um, provided you comply with a number of kind of core standards. Um, and that yep. act is quite um, disruptive in a sense. It, it, it almost, in a sense, pushes back at the MPS in terms of what the MPS is trying to achieve. Um, and it is coming into effect on the 20th of August. So from, from the date of the 20th of August, um, you will be subject to certain other parameters allowed to uh, be allowed to build three houses on your land as of right without the need for resource consent or uh, town planning approvals. Um, yeah. Essentially, the government's um, initiative there was to what they call cut the red tape out or um, or um, basically circumvent the planning, town planning system um, and allow people to you know build those three houses without that need for um, a resource consent, which we know kind of in this climate has been quite quite tricky to achieve. Yeah, so we'll, we'll touch base on that because I think there's a lot of questions around exactly what that really means. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll touch base on that really, really soon. But can you just um, give us an example or an idea of what's really changed within the, um, uh, the Act and obviously the new standards um, maybe give us an idea of the changes in the, in the table form? Yep. Or? I mean, I think, I mean, the key message really is that um, the drivers behind the NPS or National Policy Statement for Urban Development um, and, and equally mm -hmm. the Enabling Act are all going to play out in August um, through um, district plan changes. Um, so it's kind of important to note, note that they're all kind of in a sense being bundled into to one process. But the Enabling Act um, is likely to avoid that because it's, it's basically come into, come into effect on the 20th of August and allows you to build those um, three houses as a right. So I'll just quickly um, show you um, some of the new standards that are coming out. Um, yeah. So this table really um, demonstrates to you um, what the new standards are likely to look like um, coming out across essentially most of Auckland. And I'll show you that um, through the GIS if you're, you know, how, how drastically it's going to change. Um, on, on the, yeah, on the left good. hand side there is, um, or the first column is your, what's called your medium density uh, residential standards, which are essentially your, your standards um, that are going to uh, replace most zones in Auckland, um, and except for those zones within um, walkable areas, um, such as, you know, um, your revised terraced house and apartment building zones and things, which again, I'll show you on the map. Um, so yeah, they are, do you want to zoom up a little bit, just in case it's hard to read for people? Is that possible? Yeah, I'll see if I can figure that out. Uh, see if we can zoom better? in. Yeah, a little bit more. Yeah. One more zoom in. Bit. 150 maybe. Yeah, yeah that go. looks good. Yeah, go so down. these columns here are, um, for those in Auckland, are your um, your three conventional um, existing zones on your right-hand side. So you've got single house zone, mixed housing suburban zone, mixed housing urban zone. No doubt everyone is, is, is 
familiar with these rules, um, having kind of been, been working in them for seven years. Um, and then on the left hand side is the new um, standards that are coming out. And so this um, column here um, will essentially be apply to um, the bulk of, of um, zones across Auckland, except for those, as I said, in the um, close to walkable or clo close to town centres or within kind of walkable communities, which again, I'll show you on the GIS. Um, and the ones that have qualifying matters, is that? Correct. And I'll, I'll touch on those too. Yeah. yeah. So these are all um, permitted development rules in a sense, um, each of these zones. So the, the new rules allow for up to three dwellings as of right. Um, it's actually not um, too dissimilar to the mixed suburban and urban zones, which also allowed for three dwellings as of right as a permitted activity, but drastically different to your single house zone, which only allowed a, allowed one dwelling per site. Single house zone occupied around 20% of Auckland, and that's about to change. Um, Probably the biggest changes that, that we will see, particularly in the lower zones, so your single house zone and your mixed suburban zone, are the increases in heights. So under the new standards, you can, as of right, build up to 11 metres with a one metre pitch, whereas under the um, unit, old old rules, which sounds a bit crazy to call them old rules, given they're only seven years old, um, <laughs> you can build, uh, you could only build up to eight metres, currently up to eight metres. As of August, that will change. So, so is that is that another story of building, or would yep. you? So that's is that. Would you be able to build three? Yep. So that would be definitely a three-story building at you know a two point five to three meter stud height. Um, that easily allows mm -hmm. you to fit a three uh, three-story building in there. Um, even three and a half, in a sense. Um, you can. It's a. It's a decent size and it also kind of allows for um, walk-up apartments so you can start to really get that height up. Um, That's right. Yeah. Secondary to that is the height to boundary rules which are changing as well so the um, height in relation to boundary is essentially a, a, um, a standard that allows you to um, build um, a certain distance from the boundary. Um, so if I just explain it in real simple terms this um, new rule allows you to take a line four metres up from your boundary um, and then a 60 degree recession plane back into the site in a three dimensional sense. And you have to, the building has to be behind that 60 degree recession line. That the, the big difference here is that the, the old rules only allowed for a maximum 2.5 meter height on the boundary and a 45 degree recession, so a much sharper recession plane, um, and mm. in the mixed urban a three meter. What this is essentially meaning is that um, we, uh, if developing um, under these standards, you'll be able to build a lot closer and higher on your um, to the boundary. Um, not the most ideal potential outcomes for for neighbouring properties, um, but that's essentially what the rules allowing. Um, we we'll just quickly, yeah. I'll just quickly summarise these ones. Um, your front yard setback is that how far you have to be set back from the road boundary. Um, that's changed to 1.5 metres now, um, whereas previously it ranged from 2.5 to 3 metres. That's actually quite a substantial um, town planning shift that allows you to build closer yeah. to the road. Um, yeah, the building coverage is probably the biggest shift in that now you can build up to 50% of your land as of right. Um, what that means is on a thousand square meter site, uh, you can build a, floor, a building floor plate of up to 500 square meters, where under the previous rules, they ranged between 35% uh, to 45%. So that's again, uh, again, the government direction there is to push more bulk and mass on the sites to allow more housing. So they've increased building yeah. coverage. Um, yeah. So I'd just like to say that as well as all these um, uh, metrics and all these square meterage rates, um, I will be able to easily show and illustrate the, for the audience later on with um, photos and illustrations of what that actually looks like. Yeah. And then we'll have a look at, you know, what actually changed through the GIS viewer 
um, and what substan how substantial is this uh, unit three plan shift? Yeah, and yeah, so we won't, I'll touch on them just briefly, um, Ben, because we obviously walk through these yeah. later on. Um, the final yeah. one really is outlook space, but we can probably best describe that one through the visuals that we present later on. Um, that that is another change, um, and then there's a couple of um, I would call them pretty token urban design requirements that have been that have snuck in here. Um, with I suspect the reason being from Ministry for the Environment um, to introduce these to ensure at least some good design outcomes because remembering that these are, are permitted developments and they won't require resource consent. So they want at least, for example, a minimum of 20% of the front elevation to be glazed. And that's, you know, that's an urban design outcome. Um, and then they're, also, okay. so they're, they're pushing for a little bit more yeah. kind of activation of the street. Um, and that's the reason they're mm -hmm. doing that is because um, they can't capture it under a resource consent assessment. So um, they have to kind of encourage it through the rules. So. Yeah, and I just noticed that there wasn't those rules before, so this was newly put in. Is that yep? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And it's a bit of an arbitrary run, but I, I, the intent really is to hit those urban design parameters, which I kind of talked about. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I mean the big the next um, thought was really to walk you through um, the GIS or the the recently released draft planning maps. Um, and I wanted to show you, mm. uh, show the audience at a, at a very high level what, you know, the extent of changes that are actually happening across Auckland, um, because most people probably won't be too familiar with, you know, how much is actually changing and, and how bigger impact this um, change legislation will have on Auckland going forward. So, yeah. yeah so let's have a look at the uh, GIS and... Um and kind of run through exactly how to use it as well. I think there's some good tools on there that will enable us to find answers really quickly yep. as well. Is that working all right? Yes. Great. Um, so obviously this is this is a map of Auckland and this is a snapshot really of Auckland's current um, zoning under under the unitary plan. Um, I've picked kind of central Auckland in here, but equally I can I can scroll down and um, and show you other parts of Auckland as well. Um, what I wanted to really show you here was a lot of people are perhaps not overly familiar with some of the tools in here, but it's probably worth having a look at them. Um, so up in the top left corner, you, you obviously search for your site, but there's, there's a neat little tool that you can click underneath it, um, which is kind of looks like, uh, I guess, two doors with, with an arrow, um, a couple of arrows. So if you clicked on that, um, it brings this um, bar in here into play. And I wanted to just show you this just to really just quickly show you an overview of how drastic the changes are um, are going to be across Auckland come mm. August. Now, we can see, you know, the various colours within the GIS and, and the um, lighter yellow is your mixed suburban um, zones. The very mm. light white, almost cream, is um, single house. Um, and then the darker kind of orange is um, mixed urban and then the very dark orange is there or terrace house and apartment building zone and if i just quickly show you as i scroll this across what the new um planning maps are potentially going to look like i think you'll get a bit of a shock um, so if we just go go very quickly across it you can start to see mm. auckland's uh, uh, zoning landscape is going to change quite dramatically mm. um so as we head into St. Helier's uh, and Oraki in Mission Bay, um, the bulk of that area is going into this new zone, and which allows you to go to that three levels. Um, but you, you can yeah. kind of see in a real, um, very quick sense that these areas, you know, Half Moon Bay, Highland Park, they're all they're all heading oh, yeah. into um, a, a hybrid of mixed. Mm -hmm. MDOs. And even Shelley Beach Road, yeah. which is uh, sorry, Shelley Park in Cockle Bay, which is all single house at the moment, is all going into this, yes, into this right. new zone. Um, 
it demonstrates to you know how drastic the changes are going to be um, and when we focus say on um, a, a walkable community which I kind of talked about which is the NPS stuff um, you can see uh, Mount Albert change drastically so Mount Albert's gone from essentially mixed urban and, and a bit of mixed suburban and single house to the bulk of it being targeted as, as terrace house and apartment building. Um, and then Avondale is the same. So Avondale's gonna, gonna see some big changes as well. Um, and every little catchment that has that is uh, within walkable distance of um, a town center or public transport um, is, is going to see these yes, large um, dark orange uh, Thab zones coming into play. Ellerslie's another one. Yeah, those are the terrace house. Part yeah, of the and I think yeah. I'll just quickly show you the North Shore because that's probably going to be one of the bigger changes. Um, yeah, I do spend almost all day on this little thing. Plane <laughs> is <laughs> <laughs> dream. Um, it's very useful. You can see yeah. from um, you know the North Shore, predominantly mixed housing, suburban. Um, all the way up into Pine Hill, Murray's Bay. Um, the new legislation obviously completely changes that. And so mm. there's going to be quite drastic changes in here. Um, pointing out that, that places like Devonport will oh, remain wow. in those qualifying yeah. areas or, or attempt to remain in those qualifying mm. areas um, to protect heritage. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just touch on what, what do you mean by qualifying areas so the audience kind of really um, we'll kind of get a sense of what that means. Yeah, sure. Um, so under the um, national policy statement, the direction was um, for, um, uh, sorry, under the Enabling Act, the direction was for council to identify, um, to essentially make the, uh, um, the MDRS zone um, operative um, in the August the 20th, mm -hmm. except um, for those areas which are identified as um, or sites which is identified as having qualifying matters. Uh, the qualifying matters were limited to um, heritage um, and infrastructure. Mm. Um, so heritage is quite wide reaching in Auckland, um, as you can appreciate. So heritage doesn't just fall to uh, protection of a villa and heritage housing. Heritage also falls mm. to character buildings and town centres. Heritage falls to um, ecological areas, so significant ecological areas or, or tree protected areas, um, and heritage falls to um, volcanic view shafts or protecting views from to volcanic cones, uh, is, how, is, is how council has defined it. Um, the final right. qualifying matter is around um, infrastructure, and infrastructure is around um, identifying sites that have limited infrastructure or inability to provide infrastructure can fall with it um, as a qualifying matter. So those include everything from stormwater um, to wastewater mm. um, to even flooding. Um, so flooding could potentially right. be uh, considered um, as a qualifying matter. And it was actually just alluded to um, this morning in the planning committee. Um, so all of those sites that are identified yeah, as having right, yeah. qualifying matters um, will not um, obtain that um, ability to build three houses as of right. Um, you will, yeah, they'll have okay. an overlay which will restrict them and require people to uh, apply for a resource consent for those qualifying matters. Okay, so what you're saying essentially is the ones, the sites that currently have these overlays, you would, you still might be able to develop on there if you get a resource consent? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I think what's going to come out of this is going to be quite heavy research and analysis on those sites that actually are identified as qualifying matters. Whereas previous under the unitary plan, when they put blanket, blanket special character areas in place, they didn't really do street by street analysis. They just looked kind of on Google Maps. And I, I mean, I need to be careful what I say here. <laughs> But there, there was a little bit of um, relaxed or lenience to it because of the rush to try and get the unitary plan through. Um, but now it's going to be, you know, um, I mentioned um, earlier that um, to Stacey earlier prior to this, that this is a runaway train, right? This MPS and there's, there's really no driver on board. So for any of these um, 
local boards to to jump in the way of of this process and try and and create blanket overlays for protecting character they're going to face a very difficult task in doing that um, because this this is a government direction and it's not really going anywhere in fact the train's getting faster and faster so what that's essentially going to result in being is it's going to require council to individually assess the heritage of each house and wow which is which is a task in itself um that's driving the streets of Ponsonby and saying you know that that one's a 1920s bungalow um yeah that that and you mentioned, artist and you mentioned i mean it it is yeah. and then the other comment probably to make around that Ben would be there is other legislation in place to allow um council to protect heritage um through the historic places mm. trust where they can actually list buildings um grade list buildings so in a sense the government's already yeah. saying you know you've got a mechanism in place to do that we don't really want to see it in your district plan um mm. that's probably right. going to be so, yeah that's exactly. probably going to be the most debated topic uh, in the whole process i suspect um i think infrastructure's um pretty black and white um the research the mm. research will e will either confirm whether an area has re has infrastructure or it doesn't um but the heritage is a bit more subjective yeah yeah and you did mention to me earlier was that uh when we had a conversation was Ponsonby actually um through today's hearing or yesterday's hearing was actually pro going through to the new unity plan and their heritage sites? Yeah, I mean, the planning committee today was really fascinating. Um, I was very much, ex so the planning committee today was the local board, um, all the local boards meeting to make determinations on the planning maps I showed you and the changes mm -hmm. that are coming through in August. Um, mm -hmm. And I was expecting to hear quite stiff opposition on it, um, but in principle, most local board members or um, acting on behalf of their communities supported uh, densification and supported the need to remove blanket um, special character areas and, and identify oh, wow. individual mm. sites. With the exception being, I think, um, was the Devonport local board were pretty um, heated on it um, around mm. protecting character. Um, but yeah, Ponsonby, um, was definitely more in favor for individual um, house protection as opposed to blanket overlays um, mount albert was definitely right. encouraging um, high density housing or um you know terraced house and apartments um within that you know within proximity of mount albert train stations so it was all quite interesting one of the um, probably take-home points that I, that I noted was um there is a zone that is looking to increase heights even further under um the light rail corridor which i think we touched on last week oh yes they yep. took that offline and made it confidential so i didn't find out any information on it <laughs> which, would you, so i don't know what would you just be able there. to yeah would you be able to just um pull up that gis again viewer this viewer and show us like where that corridor yep. is Because I think a lot of the um, people in the audience would like to know where exactly it's, that light rail corridor. Yeah, it's a mystery corridor. I still don't have any information on it. <laughs> none the wiser. I, I mean, I do know the basis of why they're keeping it confidential, but um, you mm. know, they they're still investigating this area, um, and this has major impacts on ratepayers within these areas. Yeah, all um, all I know. Yeah, all I know is from the city all the way down to Mangroove. Is that yeah, right? so the, the light rail corridor is indicatively proposed to go from the city to um, the airport um, uh, through uh, through okay. Onihunga and to Mangere, uh Bridge. So you can yeah. see it there yeah. just um, as it travels around Dominion Road and kind of down the southern motorway. Um, so that that's the um, that's okay. the light rail corridor area under investigation. I think they call it. Um, Okay, so so it'll be it'll be a good idea to look for houses around there. <laughs> yes and no. I mean, like um, there is a driver from the from uh, the government to fund light rail through taxation, and that taxation will be in the form, somewhat in the form of rates. So, 
I suspect mm. they will be looking at a bit of a rate grabbing here. Um, and as an yeah. offset of that, they will probably be allow you to go higher in here, possibly six to eight stories. I'm oh, not yeah. sure. It's all confidential at the moment, though, Ben. I'm not really uh, privy, privy to it. Um, and then the other one really here, this this line here, the black line here that runs around the city is the 1,200, um, 1 1.2 kilometer distance from the city that, um, mm. that they want as high uh, density your apartment housing. So, yeah. 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 Would you be also able to show us like, um, you, you mentioned that there was a, a area that you can actually, or there's a place on the map that you can actually see the difference, um, whether it's um, in the preliminary plans and it's under investigation uh, for, for those areas, would you be able to tell on the on this viewer? Ah, uh, you can't really because they're the same zones. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, if I'm going to make an informed planning comment on it, I think we are enforcing uh, much bigger and higher heights within these areas. Um, and it kind mm. of makes sense because if you are to build light rail, then you have to encourage patronage and to encourage patronage, you have to increase density. So the, the push will mm. be, the push will be to increase heights and densities in here to actually justify the business model around light rail. Um, because without, you know, without the people in these areas to utilize the rail, it's not the business case doesn't really stack up on it, does it? So, I suspect that's why it's confidential at the moment because it's probably quite controversial. Yeah. Um, what's kind of, you know, they have to make um, some pretty heavy political decisions in the background before releasing to the public, um, which, which, you know, makes sense. Yeah. And um, in terms of the change, do you know where, um, is it all of Auckland's regional district or does it end somewhere? Is there a boundary where all the changes end? Is it just in the Auckland? Yeah, region? correct. So the, the, the changes the will happen, happen within the um, Auckland urban boundary, uh, which was uh, identified under the um, unitary plan. So there won't be kind of any further changes out. Um, so you can see there the, the changes are, are all within the kind of Auckland um, urban region. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is, is Red Beach included? That was just someone's question. I think it's Stella's question. Yep. In yep. the audience, and that um, just slow that um, sits quietly within the Auckland urban region. Um, so yes, oh, yeah. it is included. Yeah, you can see it there. Oh, and Orira, yeah. is the same um, up north. Yep, but it's included. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, and, and obviously um, this this uh this map is um online and operative and people anyone can use it um and we'll, we'll definitely leave it in the show notes there later on so um it's just a direct link um awesome so what we'll do is um we can kind of showcase how the changes are illustratively so because that really helped me in understanding um what height to boundary is um and relations to the boundary is um so what i'll do is i'll share quickly with the uh, audience and everyone a powerpoint presentation there um everyone can see that yep i can see that cool awesome um so basically this is building height um and you can see that it goes up um from the ground all the way up to the roof. Um, and as this picture illustrates, um, you're looking at a um, su suburban um, zone. And in, in this case, the new MDRS has changed to 11 meters to uh, and plus one meter for the roof, which stay the same um, for the urban zone as well. Um, so that didn't really change much. Um, now, if we're comparing to a MHS, which is um, mixed house suburban, it actually changed it by three more meters. And that can literally mean another um, level of um, building. Uh, is, that, is that right there, Bayard? Yeah, correct. Um, in a sense, I mean, the, the eight meters plus one does, does in principle allow for two and a half story building um, under design, but the 11 meters plus one kind of allows you to push to that um, 
like three levels without any complaint. Um, Four, or, eight. And yeah. that three levels, as I, as I said earlier, can include um, walk-up apartments, right? So as opposed to just going to a three-level house, uh, which has a lower stud height, you can build um, uh, three levels of apartments under that under that height. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And then um, I guess the coverage has also changed as you explained. So this is literally just how much building you can fit on um, this section of land. And for mixed house urban, it was 45%. And this illustration shows mixed house suburban, which was 40%. Now, if it's changed to MDRS, it's all 50%, which means out of a thousand square meters of land, you can effectively build up to 500 square meters. Um, and that's quite a lot more real estate, isn't that? Yeah, correct. I mean, it, it, it allows for an extra, you know, 10, um, 15, 10 to 5% of increased buildability across your site. Um, so it does. Help. Yeah. But if you're going up three, if you're going up three stories, that's multiplied by three well, that's as exactly well. exactly right. So, it's a yeah. so square meters. you know, a thousand yeah. square meters, you know, your um, GFAs. For 1,500 square meters, um, as opposed to under the, the old rules, kind of somewhere in the middle mix suburban, where it was more like 800 square meters, maybe 600 square meters. Yeah. So there's quite a lot more um, building on site under um, those more more outer suburb sites. I would I would suggest, as opposed to you know the ones that were in mixed urban already, um, it's the ones that were in single house yeah. and um, mixed suburban that's that are going to see uh some some much more freer planning controls i guess hmm. yeah absolutely especially single house yeah, <laughs> yeah um, that's scary and and that yeah so essentially mdrs for building coverage is you're moving from you know you're moving towards that terrace house apartment zone building coverage of 50 percent. so like everything is going towards that range so um you're tying it together uh because Terrace house apartment zone is fifty percent currently, um, and that's everything's kind of changing towards that. Yeah, and I think um, kind of if crazy. you work through these models, you know, from a developer perspective, which we've done numerous times here, um, you find often that the that the building coverage requirement is 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 challenging under the current legislation to comply with. So, to give a little bit more mm -hmm. Flexibility up to fifty percent um, will result in you know a, a, a different outcomes. I think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And these are not the main changes, and we'll get to later. Um, so this kind of gives us an example of um, how each zone is placed under the, their own rules, and from a single house to to a mixed house, a mixed um, housing suburban, to urban to the MDRS. Um, so that's that's kind of um, the comparison of maximum theoretical building coverage in bulk. And by the way, all this, all these photos are from uh, Auckland Council, so um, they've they've given them these out to everyone to have a look as well. Um, it's just pretty nice to display in terms of the differences, especially the height to boundary ratios later on as well that we'll see. Yeah, you, I mean, this kind of indicates that you're not going to see a drastic change from mixed urban to the new standards, but, you know, from those mixed housing, suburban and single house zones, um, it's pretty clear within this diagram, you're going to see, you know, some a much more an enabling um, uh, site parameters or planning parameters. Enabling. Yeah. Um, whether yeah. people actually build those boxes. <laughs> is another <laughs> yeah it's another story yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this gives you another view obviously from the road uh, in terms of what the differences are um you've got single house um you've got mixed house suburban you got mixed house urban um and you've got the mdrs um and like what Bayo said this is just an indication <laughs> of what you can do it's not what you probably may want to do um so so yeah, it's quite, I mean, it's good. At yeah, and again, just showing quite drastic, but particularly the height limits. Um, and mm. you know, you're talking about a uh, um, zone that is essentially going to blanket Auckland, Ooh. and that means that you know, on the right hand side, that kind of mass, um, in theory, if if it wanted to, could pop up 
in you know mm. Murray's Bay or further out um, in suburban Ponsonby or yeah. even the suburban areas you know like uh, much further out um, so it's quite different to the one on the left which is a single house zone which is where those areas predominantly are zoned um, yeah not saying that it, that it that it will happen because there will be economics behind it all and the ability to actually do it um, to make it stack up but yeah it's just showing you the extent of permitted development you can achieve on sites versus um, what yeah. you um, currently can do under the unitary plan quite drastic for a couple of those zones yeah absolutely and this one's quite big um in terms of it because the height in relation to his boundary um has changed um quite respectively according to um the, the house uh, the mixed house urban and also the suburban um it's now changed from 45 degrees to 60 degrees and also from I think it was three meters for the urban and two and a half for the suburban to four meters in height. Yeah. Um, so height to boundary, if you just think of it as an envelope um, that that starts from the boundary, goes up a certain height, um, 2.5 or four meters, and creates an envelope within the site um, that you can build underneath. Um, and this is what this diagram kind of shows you. Um, by increasing the height, on the boundary to four meters it just allows you to go up higher and closer to the boundary because um, naturally as, as that yeah. angle um, sharpens and gets a lot uh, more steeper you can push your building a lot closer to the boundary so that, that's kind of it in a simple sense um so rather than you know rather yeah. than a, a, a two meter setback from the boundary you're likely to see you know one meter setbacks and things yeah and this is probably not the best example that you can see um but um you can literally see the angle this is probably better representation of the angle where you can actually build more on the second level or third levels there opposed to before where the angles are a lot more um sharper there yeah exactly and that's yeah what what it's kind of demonstrating um that if you kind of drew a drew a development line um on one page versus the on one diagram versus the other one you can see which one's going to be higher and closer to the boundary um Yep. yeah this one's probably the most important one um i'll let you drive this one there Bayo. um what's changed in the outlook space yeah, i think the outlook space in a real simple sense outlook um the rule around outlook or standard around outlook space is to uh, uh, provide for a six meter distance between the principal living room so your living area um and the boundary or in some cases it allows it to go over driveways if, if you're a living space is at um second floor uh, first floor um mm -hmm. six meters is quite a substantial distance to the boundary um and is very mm. challenging to comply with in most most um, infill housing examples um, so they have shrunk that distance to four meters so the distance now is four meters by four meters um which again mm -hmm. encourages you to build close to the boundary. Um, so that's quite a big change because that that the intent of Outlook is to protect privacy um, of neighbours um, and to ensure that you know there is um, a positive outlook from your principal living area so you don't feel crammed in. Um, so we're yeah. going to see some big urban design changes in here if, if people are building to these standards because you are going to have people that are essentially looking over your site that are closer to the boundary um, as a result of this thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this is another one. Yeah. Um, very bad yes. example, but um, this is from the council as well in terms of uh, a building separation outlook scenario. Um, this was mixed housing urban as it stands currently versus MDRS. Um, and you can see the difference is that you can build quite close up to the boundary um, and the outlooks are still in, in place um, for the new rules. Um, definitely not something that um, most people would do. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's an example. I think council is demonstrating here, you know, um, in perhaps quite a negative sense, um, what the, you know, the new government driven MDRS rules uh, what what um, environmental outcomes the government-driven MDRS rules will create, um, and they're trying to 
demonstrate here that it, it's probably going to result in worse outcomes for people. Um, but in reality, I don't think I don't think it necessarily will happen like that. I think the market will probably drive that a little bit. Um, but it is yeah. showing you in a real um, basic sense how close you can get to a boundary now, um, as opposed to under the mm. previous rules where you needed quite quite a heavy setback from the boundary. Um, you know, almost a utopian kind of view on things was mixed urban versus um, people's uh, challenges to comply with those standards. And now the, the more flexible MDRS rules, which allow you to go a bit closer, which are probably somewhere in the middle between utopian and more kind of um, driven, you know, driven for infill housing. So. Yeah, yeah, understandable. And outdoor living space remains the same. So <laughs> that's good news. Um, and, and it's quite lenient, like you said before, um, 20 square meters. Yeah, it was always, it was always a lenient standard um, originally. Um, and so that, that hasn't got a, mm. that hasn't changed. Yet. 20 square meters is not a huge amount of outdoor space. The landscaping area though changed. It changed to 20%. Correct, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I mean, this this has been dropped quite significantly and I'm, I'm, I'm um, interested to see how they're going to combat or challenge um, uh, runoff, stormwater mm. runoff, because they're essentially increasing oh, building right. coverage and then dropping landscaping. So um, yeah. I'm not sure how they're going to um, tackle that. I think I think on the um, qualifying matters, which I talked about, um, they will definitely mm. be targeting those areas that have insufficient stormwater networks um, to avoid yeah. You know, over um, over development of areas um, and increase in impervious coverages to that result in flooding and and, and heavy runoff and high rainfall events. Um, because these yeah. are even so these are even thing. looser in terms of um, you know putting more impervious coverage on a site. Mm. That's right, because the imper we, the only one thing that we didn't touch on is impervious area, and. Uh, as if I remember correctly before for the urban site and um, Terrace House Apartment Zone it was 70%, yep. correct? And Suburban was 65. Um, has that changed or? No, I mean, so this is essentially just adding it up, right? So you've got your building coverage, which is 50%. Um, mm. um, there's no need for car parking. So there's no kind of minimum standard on that. And then there's 20% landscaping. And then I guess the rest is made up of impervious. So it's still kind of it's still hitting that seventy percent. Uh, sorry, it's it's hitting more like hitting more like eighty percent. Um, but yeah, eighty percent of land can be covered in impervious. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I believe we got some questions in the audience there. Um, maybe Stacey, if you could run them off, and then we'll conclude everything. Yep. Yeah, sure thing. Um, just so you to start. Um, a question from Mia. Um, under the new unitary plan, the single house zone allows for three dwellings. Do these three dwellings get separate titles? Yep, uh, good question. Um, I think it was a question you raised earlier as well, Ben. Um, so there's two components to a resource consent process. Mayor. There's the um, land use component, which is your houses um, and what, you've, what you're kind of doing on your land. And then there's the subdivision um, component to your resource consent. Um, in a sense, the MDRS is allowing you to do your land use component as a right. So build those three houses. Um, but you will still need to um, pass the tests um, under the RMA for subdivision consent. So it is allowing you to build three houses of right, but you'll still need to go down a subdivision process to, um, to obtain titles um, and subdivide the land. Um, they are not going to turn around and decline you for your subdivision um, because essentially you can build those three houses as of right, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, cool. And from Terry, could council decide to implement more permissive standards in their upcoming plan change than described in the Amendment Act? The Act appears to set a minimum with in MDRS. Uh, yep, good question, Terry. I think, um, so the, it, going back to what I was um, 
um, discussing earlier around the two key components. So the MDRS is basically locked in stone in terms of um, the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act is very clear on its rules and the rules are even stipulated within the Act and they will come into force in, um, in August, as I mentioned. Um, so in answer to your question, no, there won't be any tinkering with those rules. Um, they are what they are. Um, the government's uh, written them and um, that, that is what it is. Um, in terms of where the government, uh, so to, in terms of where council can make some tweaks and minor alterations to standards will be around those um, areas under the NPS, which is the walkable catchments and the walkable um, communities um, areas. So for example, in the THAB zone, while they have to hit a certain height limit under the um, NPS of six storeys, um, they can still tinker with those rules slightly to kind of fit within their what they really want, um, as opposed to kind of what the what what the black and white direction of, of the government is. Um, in that, under the NPS, it's 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 less black and white; it's more grey. So, mm. do you think there will be a lot of of those situations coming up where councils trying to decide as much as they can? Um, yeah, yes and no. I mean, it's always difficult to let go of things, right? So. Um, I think that the difference in this one is that this is very much uh, a direction from the government. Um, I touched on that in the first webinar that, you know, this is a freight train that is just, it's moving and, and it's going to be difficult to stop. Um, the driving force kind of behind it from the government was to take it out of the hands of the ratepayer, right? So um, they found that the ratepayers were, were slightly disruptive through the unitary plan process and made it, um, Un, uh, it resulted in a lot of underzoning across Auckland, um, and now they they, are, they don't really have a huge amount of ability to have a say in this process. So uh, there, there will be challenges through those qualifying matters and things which I mentioned, but the council is going to be very hard to try and you know uh, make tweaks and adjustments to the plans that that are contrary to the um, overall intent of the NPS. Um, it's driven for um, infill housing and high density housing within walkable community, uh, walkable um, locations. Um, and the, the council's going to be um, struggling to kind of stop that. Yeah. Cool. I think that's um, the questions that haven't been addressed um, throughout the conversation. Um, ben, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I actually had a question there. Um, and that, and I think this is, um, what everyone's thinking as well in terms of when the MDRS comes out um, and the government's pushing out for three, um, you know, three buildings um, within um, uh, without their resource consent. Um, would that are they looking to you know save their time in terms of um, processing those resource consents, and that would that lead to a faster um, building? Um, environment or what would, or would you say the time frame of that would be would it be the same as currently or would it be quicker in terms of getting your um getting you ready to build yeah um good question um it definitely will reduce time frames for um initiating your ability to build on site um the you know the current council processing time frames for a resource consent are six months and if you were a more conservative developer and wanted to wait for resource consent before you jumped into um, building consent, well, then there's a six month lag time just to get through council, even up to eight months we're seeing now. Um, so you're skipping yeah. that process um, with with three houses, um, you know, caveating those three houses that yeah. you don't trigger something else that needs a resource consent because there's another a lot of other matters that you need to address. Um, yeah. But, you know, if, if it was the perfect site and you could build three houses as of right um, and you didn't need that resource consent and it was determined by, um, you know, your consultants, you didn't need it, um, then 100% you'll be on site quicker um, because you'll essentially mm -hmm. move from concept into develop design into uh, building consent um, far quicker than you would if you had to go concept, uh, develop design, resource consent building consent, you know, all the other processes that architects follow through. So, yeah, you you, yeah. you should probably shave, you know, conservatively um, a few months of your of your program. Yeah. Yeah. Understandable. Got it. Um, another question would be, um, 
So in terms of the qualifying conditions, I know that MDRS has actually now released better qualifying conditions than we currently have for the zones. But let's say that I wanted to stretch and I wanted to build a little bit more. Do you think council would come back and um, say it's a 100% no, you can't go over the qualifying conditions currently, or would they still have some leniency there? Um, I mean, every resource consent in a sense has got a basis for um, arguing effects, right? So mm. in the event that you are in a qualifying matter that say pertains to infrastructure, um, then provided your um, mm -hmm. consultants can build, you know, a robust argument around building in a floodplain or, um, you know, providing detention tanks to mitigate stormwater runoff, um, then there is every basis you can still obtain resource consent. So um, that is the intent yeah. of the RMA is to assess the effects on the environment and provided you can um, appropriately avoid um, and mitigate those effects um, through specialist reporting and your assessments, then the answer would be it shouldn't shouldn't stop you from getting a resource consent. The heritage one's a bit of a different one because it's um you know knocking yeah. down a heritage home that's been identified as, as a qualifying matter is probably a much higher threshold to overcome. Um, you're not going to be able to just whip out a heritage report and you know hope for the best. Like I think um, I, I I think those those things <laughs> those sites will probably be the sites that will be least developable. Mm. Yeah. What what about um special ecological areas, um, especially out west and um by the coastal areas, um, like sea? Yeah, it's the ecological areas one's an interesting one because it's almost um, you know, from, from when the national government removed general tree protection rules, um it, it's got it's almost got progressively worse for nature in that it's a death by a thousand cuts <laughs> in a sense, because Yes, so the SEA was created to, you know, blanket protect the ecological areas, um, and now they're having to claw that back even further. So, I suspect those SEA areas uh, that are of high value and and fit within that qualifying matter parameter will be heavily protected, and so they, you know, you won't be able to touch those yeah. at all <laughs> um, because they've nice. lost so much, um, you know, bush and vegetation mm -hmm. through these these plan changes that have happened over the last ten years that. You know they'll probably be doing everything they can to try and protect the last remnants of, um, of native bush yeah yeah um, because mia had a question in terms of um what qualifies um a single house zone to fit in the mdrs and i think you can just go on to that um preliminary viewer and have a look and see if your single house zone home is um now changed and if there's any yeah i think i mean the only the only comment i'd make on that Mia, would be um all um are subject to those those walkable area uh, locations all zones are changing to this new mdrs um the only areas that uh, single house areas that will remain intact will be the ones where they uh, meet qualifying matters for protecting heritage um it's, you know there's housing yeah. along ani um Crescent, um, there's a bit within Greyland mm -hmm. as an example. Um, those areas will probably fit within that two story zone, which is kind of protecting the heritage. Um, the rest yeah. is just going to flick uh, um, into this yeah, NDRS um, zone. Cool. I think we've got a last question from Terry there. He says that are all RC applications currently being processed by council grandfathered to the old unitary plan or will applications currently being processed by subject to the plan change from 20th of August? Good question. Um, it's a, probably a burning question on everyone's mind, I think. Um, the answer to that, Terry, is that, you know, come the 20th of August, um, the MDRS standards for th up to three houses will be per will be um, permitted um, straight away, or will be um, in, um, in place straight away. Um, and then the rest of the changes, which is quite substantial, so the qualifying matters and the uh, um, changes to these um, uh, fab zones and things like that, um, will go through the plan change, normal plan change process um, that the government has directed. 
uh, that process uh, required the government uh, required council to consider the um, plan changes within 24 months from the beginning of mm -hmm. this year. So by August 2023, um, we'll start to see decisions made on those changes. Um, and in answer to your question around how the government will assess, or how the council will assess consent, they will start to be attributing weight to those new rules the further they go through the process. So from the 20th of August, mm. you'll be able to build those kind of three houses as a right under the MDRS rules, as long as you fit within those zones. Um, and you know, provided you're not in the qualifying matter areas. Um, and then as it goes through the process next year, it'll gather the, uh, the other changes will gather more and more weight. Um, and that means that when council officers pick it up, they will get to a point where they have to give more weight to the new rules over the old rules. Um, and so, you know, they will start to balance, right. you know, call it um, July next year, they'll start to balance the MPS rules over the old unitary plan rules and they'll probably the NPS rules will probably have more weight at that point. Mm. Mm. Okay. Cool. I think that was <laughs> all the questions there. Um I have obviously so much more questions and so many more uh thoughts on my on my brain, but um I think we are almost up for time, isn't that right? So yeah, probably there is um a question about getting those um, slides that you had up. Um, uh, is the yes, best way yes, um, to email it through to people, or can we share a link here? Yeah, yeah, I, I'll share everything in this uh, webinar in the show notes there, and the links to where to get things. Um, so I'll I'll be able to give you those there, so you can have those as well, Stacey. Cool. Um, and another question on where can you where can I find the document showing the latest changes? Um, for that person, I put a link further up in the chat. So just um, check out that link. Yeah, and that'll be yeah, yeah. That's right over there in the chat, and also will be in the show notes as well. Cool, cool, awesome. Well, thanks, Faya, for coming. Um, it's definitely a pleasure for you to come over and share your knowledge. Um, we'll definitely want you to come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> and the next webinar will be having a post as well. It's number four webinar, um, and um, we'll issue that out in the post next week no worries and thank you guys cool. really enjoyed that i uh, hope you found it informative and yeah hope you all have a lovely night yeah cool thanks guys. cheers, cheers thank you. thanks Bea. thanks thank everyone you. cheers bye bye, -bye.